That is shenaniganery of the highest order. And I won't stand for it. I'll sit. Also, I'm sorry everyone. I am a filthy, filthy liar. Um, I didn't end up grabbing the apple cider and cinnamon. I have them. But I have a cranberry ginger instead. And this looked super good. And uh, I think I'm going to nurse on this while we're uh, going to discuss... Uh, while we're going to discuss uh, fantasy. You know, what? what is it? What makes fantasy fantasy? Now, is it is it cool stuff? Like, uh, you know, hooded figures and, uh, you know, and... Uh, you know, everything is, is made, you know, old-fashioned way out of wood, and, and we have lamplight. People walk around with uh, uh, capes and staves. And then, you know, oh, there's a little fairy dragon. Uh, you know, this is very, very fantasy, right? Those don't necessarily exist in real life. Oh, that's good stuff. I, I know I joke about the, the Kroger sponsorship thing, and I'll take it, don't get me wrong. But Sparkling Ice, if you all want a sponsor, or if you want to sponsor someone, my friends. <laughs> my friends at Sparkling Ice. Ah. Oh. So yes, we're going to open up, we're going to open up our NaNoWriMo workshop series, week one, by exploring just what hot and tar nation is fantasy. And for many of us who most likely have played D&D &D or a similar game, you know, Pathfinder or Zweihander or uh, Warhammer Fantasy, uh, role-playing, Age of Sigmar. Um, you know, uh, maybe you've played RuneQuest. And, in all honesty, Vampire the Masquerade. Call of Cthulhu. Cyberpunk. I mean, you, you might say, well, that's, that's way more sci-fi than fantasy. And, yeah... Yes, but no, but yes, but no. Anyway, we'll get into that sort of stuff. Um, all right, ready to nap? <laughs> Lurk away. Yeah, yeah, Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars is, uh, well, you'll see a good many references pop up here. And, and so why would I talk about that? Why would I ask that question of what is fantasy? Clearly, we all know. And also, clearly, we would disagree on what would qualify for fantasy. You know, it, it's that, what's the fallacy, the the no true Scotsman, I guess talking about Daly's, uh, uh, you know, planned trip here, the, the no true Scotsman uh, fallacy, no true fantasy story doesn't have magic, no true fantasy story uh, has only humans, that kind of a thing. So I figured, let's discuss fantasy and explore it, because with your all's help, at least here tonight live, and if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, hello, hi YouTube, howdy, thank you for joining us in our workshop, um, yep, that, that will be a consideration, Hoylepa. Uh, Let's let's at least look at what fantasy could be. Mostly is. What could fantasy offer? If we're having difficulty with a solid shape or a container of fantasy, let's look at the potential of fantasy. And that is going to help guide us in our writing. So that way we can uh, lean into themes that are appropriate for that style, and sometimes even inappropriate. 
else how might you challenge uh, the norm for it? How else might you stand out? Or what's your unique thing? As that is something many of us face. There's nothing new under the sun. And like, oh, I don't want... I want my I want my fantasy story to to be not just you know not just D and D, not just well you know for the longest time uh, with uh, with Wizards of the Coast Watsy W O T C um, you know especially when it came to Magic the Gathering of course that was a game invented to play uh, by its players in between their sessions of D and D. But for a good long while, uh, many people joked that uh, Watsy stood for warmed over Tolkien crap. You know, oh, it's so you know, it's it's unoriginal. It's it's very derivative. It's you know, there is nothing new. And you're like, ah, can I have an epic fantasy and not not have a Lord of the Rings? How can I how can I make it mine? But so many people already have elves and dwarves and you know. But I have this neat idea. Okay? Keep that idea. Let's see what we can do with it. Now, here I do have open uh, my uh, my backup copies of uh, my official 5e rule books here. The Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide. And if you don't have copies of these books, please support your friendly local game store. And if you don't have a friendly local game store, I happen to, uh, to know a guy who can get these books out to you through his. But contained, uh, contained within these books, there is a very good advice on, you know, delving... Well, this actually is a, a little bit up from the art here in part one. But we're at the very... Uh, we're at the very beginning of the books. This is foundational. Um, now, I'm not going to read everything in each part of the books. I want you to open up your books and read them if you have it, or get the books if you don't. And if you need experience with this as well, uh, something more than what the book can offer, find a community like ours, IRL or online, and ask those questions. Many of us got into storytelling, adventuring, role-playing, because someone else helped bring us in to teach us, to familiarize us, to give us a... Um, you know, a head start or a, a, a diving board uh, kind of a thing. And you can read about aspects of fantasy. There's reference here. Uh, the the books uh, will have just listed. If you want fantasy reading, here's a list of recommended reads for you all. Um... The the topics here are a primer. Though keep in mind that there is a difference between running a fantasy game and composing a fantasy story. A book, a narration. Something that is really only meant to be engaged with by an active reader then, you know, whatever, three to three to five, three to six friends or family members at your table. But there's a lot of very good uh, universal concepts that are helping to prepare you for your role in the game. Being a dungeon master in D&D, &D, a GM in other systems, or an ST in others still, you are akin to an author. But it's important that unless your players understand they are participating in a live narration of a story, that a role-playing game is very much a living story and one that even the author may not have control of. Kind of reminds me of Alan Wake. I guess it might put a, a, a date on this video, but Alan Wake 2 just recently came out. Uh, the concept behind Alan Wake 1, I thought, was uh, was pretty interesting. And if you're not familiar with it, give it a look. 
But these are things that come up over the course of a story, uh, over an adventure. You know, aspects of problem solving, exploring. Um, we come down here and it talks about the three pillars. Um, the three pillars of uh, adventure is exploration, social interaction, and combat. And these would be things that would come up in, uh, in both styles of creation. So look through it, read what's in these books. We'll, we'll come back and reference it. But I, I want, we're starting here, but we're going to quickly depart. We are going to revisit, especially when we talk about things like the magic system that we want. Uh, the D&D books uh, are 50. There's a, you can save, you can save some if you, uh, there's a, um, a three pack. So it's all three rule books and a DM screen inside a slip case. And that's like a combo pack that can save you some money as well. Um, but yeah, the, the MSRP on the D&D books is 50. And I believe that's going to be going up uh, soon. In fact, some of the newer printed books uh, are up to 60. And I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's rough for a, a store like this. This is a little bit of an aside. And why we, we absolutely appreciate the business that you give us. Because we have to compete against the publisher. Wizards of the Coast sells their rule books on Amazon for less than what I can buy them at wholesale. And you get free shit. And you're like, well, why, why are you telling people this? It's out there and it you're, you're going to do it or not, right? And this is not a guilt trip for anyone out there, but just stating the fact about where, where is it that stores like this find, you know, how do we have the unmitigated gall to ask for MSRP on something that the publisher itself uh, is selling at wholesale with free shipping on, on Amazon? And it's for moments like this where we get together and we, we can tell a story. We can explore the system and ask questions we can share our experiences. Um, it It is, and there's many stores and even distributors who don't like the fact that all of us have to compete against the publisher who gets to print the books for pennies on the dollar and is probably still you know, making a, a good amount selling it at wholesale cost uh, on Amazon um, because it, it undercuts everyone, in, you know, and... But that's a whole other topic for a whole other time, Lunar. Um, uh, Hasbro slash Wizards is um, in an unfavorable phase with a lot of people right now uh, for reasons kind of like that and, and beyond. But I'm, I'm not here to talk about their corporate culture or leadership or... it. Well, <laughs> it's not even conspiracy level. It, it's, it's blatantly out in front of everyone in, in real time. It's not a partisan issue and it's not even conspiracy level stuff. Lunar. But it's just... At least for this workshop time, I, I don't want to think about it. Because <laughs> I have to go back to the store and see it every day. So, <laughs> I'm gonna... It would. And, and believe me, you know what, Lunar? Uh, if it's something... If it's something that would interest you all... Maybe I can actually have a a very level-headed and even-toned hashtag real talk about issues like that. If you all would would be interested in learning about it, not that it's it's playing up into sensationalism or uh, uh, sensationalism or some sort of you know uh, rage bait clickbait. If you want to know how it is. I'll, I'll tell it how it is. I have a soapbox emote for a reason. If any of you want to type soapbox, capital S, capital B, no space. But what's nice about the books is they'll last you for as long as you can keep the book intact. Uh, one book can last you for years and has, you know, near infinite replayability. And that really makes role-playing a rather inexpensive hobby to get into. But let's, you know, let, let's uh, take that into the realm of writing now. 
these are these are aspects that we are going to ask ourselves and explore in the setup of our novel we're going to outline and do some sample passages uh here together uh you know how known is the world are monsters uncommon or rare is magic everywhere even compared to average D&D, average, you know, street level Pathfinder, I mean, not street level, but average, your average Pathfinder game. If you have a setting that is your own or even take a, a published setting like Eberron, magic is everywhere in Eberron. It's broad, but not very deep. There are not many powerful casters. In fact, speaking mechanically, there's not many people really above a couple levels, if that. I believe it's the King of Corvair, who is a veteran of the Hundred Year War, and the king of the like the most populous uh, nation on the continent. He is a level five fighter. And so that's that's the the power level, in a sense, that you know you're working with. And these are things to consider. How known is the world? Is it, are you in an age of exploration? Is, are things known? Is it internal political intrigue or is it the mysteries of what lies beyond the borders? So there's a lot here to read and consider. Uh, I'm going to leave this for you to do in uh, in your core rule books, and uh, I will uh, and I, I can bring up here as well, just as a, a, a quick show for any of you. Who are uh, who are joining? Oh, by the way, we're almost at four thousand. We're a little under a hundred, and I, I'm looking forward to giving away that TM at when we hit four K. Uh, here, here is uh, the outline of what our workshops will be. What is fantasy? And we're going to choose our subgenre. Then we're going to tomorrow we're going to look at our setting and we're going to map it out. Then we're going to talk about magic and magic systems, as well as monsters and the kind of the ecosystem. Um, that uh, we're going to employ, and it'll go out from there. All right. Now, delving into it. On the heels of NaNoWriMo having started not that long ago, and if, if you want to know more about it, there's the official website, although it's a it's a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, whether or not, you know, you officially participate or if you, you know, if you do any charity work through the, the actual organization... Uh, this is the inspiration, uh, as this is probably, most likely, a U.S.-based concept. Uh, for those of you who live outside the U.S., or maybe like, you know, North America, uh, or U.S. Canada. Uh, but if you live outside the U.S. and NaNoWriMo is something that is, uh, being embraced there, I'd love to hear about it. A couple other references. We're going to talk about a, a few different things to set up a perimeter of context. Then we're going to explore what is inside that perimeter that we have made together. And so the first source that we're going to look over here, five essential elements every fantasy novel needs. That might sound a little sensational, I might agree. Though, I think there is a lot of similarities that we can point out, just in different degrees, in, in different uh, different takes on a similar concept. So, you want to write a fantasy novel. You're enamored with epic sagas from the likes of Tolkien, Martin, and Rowling. You love everything about the genre, and you feel that you have your own fantasy story to tell. But this is a complicated genre to write in. While there aren't hard and fast rules to follow, there are certain elements that must be included for a story to be classified as fantasy. However original your story may be, it does need to fit somewhere within the genre if you're going to attract an audience. And that's another... Maybe that's the conversation for the subgenre. Who is our target audience? And if you are ever asked that question, or you're asking it yourself... The answer is never, ever, ever, everybody. Get that out of your brain. You're, you hope for it. That everybody is never going to be an actual target audience. Now, 
that, I'm gonna save that for the, I'm gonna save that for the, the that conversation. Fantasy readers expect certain things from the books they consume. And no, we're not talking about common tropes like elves, dwarves, trolls, and dragons. We're referring to much broader elements, general concepts within which you can be as inventive and imaginative as you like. So without further ado, let's take a look at the five essential elements every fantasy novel needs. A magic system. Now, this was discussed up above, that there are systems with low or even no magic that are, are fantasy. This element that sets fantasy fiction apart from other genres or this is the element for a story to be considered fantasy it needs to contain some sort of magic system what exactly do we mean by this in short a magic system refers to things that occur or exist in your story that do not or cannot exist in the real world elements of sorcery witchcraft and enchantment <coughs> pardon fantastical creatures and the supernatural advanced abilities or powers Basically, anything with no basis in real-world evidence or logic can be considered magic. So that that's the bit of the catch. I like. Well, you know, I, I've read I've read fantasies, and there, there's been no no magic. I mean, no one's cast a spell. Are there, you know, giant flying lizards that breathe fire? Um, are there? Um, I don't know. Uh, while there's no there's nobody casting magic, are there like floating islands? Um, is there a, a rather large anachronistic, uh, like, you find the airship, but it's only the medieval period kind of a thing? Elements like that would be magical and would bring you into the realm of fantasy. This is where you can really set your story apart, apart from, the other, uh, <clears throat> from others in the genre. If your magic system is completely unique and imaginative... If it's something readers haven't seen before, your novel has a point of difference. An innovative, intriguing magic system is often the key to helping your novel stand out in the saturated fantasy market. Your magic system should play a key part in your story. Whether it's a source of conflict, see more on this below, a driving plot force, or a means for character development, magic is of vital importance in every fantasy novel but it can't be treated merely as a convenient plot device. Your magic system needs to have established rules, and it, and it needs to follow them. How blatant you make the rules, that's, that's ultimately up to you, and that's going to come into the conversation of uh, hard magic system, soft magic system, that kind of a thing. More on that in a future broadcast. To get an idea of what constitutes a well-developed magic system, take a look at the works of some established fantasy authors. George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series contains some standard magical elements such as dragons, prophecies, and the resurrected dead, but the complex way he weaves these elements together makes for a compelling and original fantasy. Uh, Patrick Rothfuss's uh, King Killer Chronicles, on the other hand, involves a unique magic system that is almost more like a science. The central story revolves around people known as Arcanists, who practice arts like alchemy, sympathy, a type of energy manipulation, and naming, wherein someone discovers the true name of a thing, and therefore can control and command that thing. As you'll see when you dip into the vast canon of fantasy literature, there's no end to the creativity and originality that can be channeled into a magic system. A well-developed setting. This is another absolutely vital element within fantasy fiction. When you're writing in this genre, your story takes place in a completely new world. And even if your fantasy is based on Earth, it's not the Earth we actually know. In order to immerse readers in your world, you must develop your setting thoroughly and thoughtfully. In fantasy writing, this process is often referred to as world-building. J.R.R. Tolkien is often viewed as the original master world builder. The depth and detail with which he created the world of Middle-earth is unparalleled. Everything from language to societal customs to history and lore is explored throughout The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and supplementary, and supplementary texts such as the, Silmar <clears throat> the Silmarillion. There we go. 
Now, don't intimidate yourself by comparing your world building to that of a master like Tolkien. Remember that the world of Middle-earth was his life's work. He spent years and years developing it. When you're writing your first fantasy novel, it's best to start small and build your world from the ground up. Here are a few things to consider when starting the process of developing your setting. What does it look like, sound like, and smell like? Smell is such an underrated, and anecdotally, underused descriptive method in role-playing and in storytelling. And yet it's the only one of our five senses that is directly connected to our brain. You can do so much with smell. So there's considerations. I'm not going to read this, you know, point for point. You can, you can read this along. I supplied the link above. As with any novel, uh, by the way, a complex cast of characters. It's often the characters in fantasy fiction that truly get readers invested in the story. Your setting, plot, and magic system may intrigue and engage readers, but none of these aspects matter if your readers don't care about the characters and their outcomes. How many characters now your story contains is up to you. But if you're writing a series, as the majority of fantasy writers are, it's better to have a cast of several main characters as well as your auxiliary characters. This provides interest and diversity within the story, helping to sustain readers' engagement over multiple books. I... I agree many people write to a hopeful multi-book story. I will not dissuade any for anyone from doing so. But man, make your Hobbit before you make your Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, uh, focus on that, that little bit of that little corner, right? Plant that seed and let it grow, and then it can split off, and you can plant the other seeds and do more and more and more. Um, in my opinion. Uh, so it talks about having a standout main character, and that's exactly what we are going to... Um, that's what we are going to be uh, pursuing here. Why is my webcam? Here we go. And do make sure that they're flawed. Uh, we can touch on the concept of a Mary Sue character when we cross that bridge. Um, while this is a world of fantasy and fantastic things happen, there's still a level of connection with the reader. As many, many people may look to fantasy uh, to explore things with which we're familiar but might like to see it in another light or explained a different way or to give us another way to consider something that might otherwise be familiar on a personal level or a broader level. And hopefully it's more that personal connection that you can make with people. Um, I, I'm in the camp of please, please don't drag real life stuff into fantasy. It happens. And fantasy can be used for very overt symbolism or a very thinly veiled exploration of a topic uh, and people have different tolerances for that but I would I would compel you all in your fantasy story if there is an element in it that is similar to something of real life fine it's similar there are many uh, parallels that can come up in life coincidences or just the natural order of things uh, where there's really just a similar direction that things flow. Um, but piercing that liminality between your fantasy and reality is a very dangerous thing, or making it too thin. Because in that case, many people want to engage with fantasy as a form of escapism. As a, as a, a way to disengage from the real world in which we spend much of our time and are probably, you know, maybe at the end of the day you're tired of it. You want to go into an MMORPG. You want to watch your favorite fantasy movie. You want to read a book that takes you into a different place and not be drugged back 
kicking and screaming with real world stuff. And hopefully you can find stories that compel you that way and that can challenge you and that can, you know, reveal maybe to you personally it is. You know, I never thought of, you know, it, well, well, what happened in the book is different than what I am familiar with in real life going on. That's an interesting take on the concept from those characters. So more about the characters you can read about it the central conflict we're definitely going to get there because of all the characters that we're making do you know uh, did any of you see the schedule with whom we're starting we're starting with the villain Shh, don't tell anyone why the story is about the villain the story is about the villain's plans and actions it's just we don't follow it necessarily from the villain's point of view. So it's important. The star of our story, the villain, is the central pillar around which everything else is going to revolve. And thank you very much, uh, Diesel. I appreciate the follow. Welcome to the Hero Zone. A power structure or a system of government as well. It could be kingdoms. Uh, it could be... Uh, majocracies. It could be a theocracy. It could be a, an entirely new and original governmental system uh, that you made up that fits the culture of the people. But there's still a structure. And the reason why we, we do have structures is it gives us something to latch on to. In a world in which we may be completely unfamiliar with I mean, we presume gravity works the same as we know it. But it's hard for us to fathom gravity in different ways. So if it's different on that planet, now maybe the people who are there have adapted. If, if that planet is actually, turns out to be twice the size of Earth, your humans are, are you know, the, what's the Shakespeare quote? A rose by any other name is still a rose. You still have humans and dwarves, it's just that they might be uh, maybe shorter or stronger, maybe even bigger. It depends on how, I don't know, how uh, oxygen or some other gas rich is the, the atmosphere to support the growth and development of life, that kind of a thing. But we, as the, the common IRL reader that has been isekai'd into this fantasy realm, needs to understand something that we can use as a position to gauge importance, power, uh, why things are happening. Otherwise, I mean, if any of you have, have uh, traveled to, you know, a different country or heck, I don't know, maybe as a, a little kid, you went over to your best friend's house and your friend's parents do not run the house like your parents ran the house. And it feels like you're in a completely strange land. You know, for better or worse, right? And you, you feel like, what's my frame of reference? I, what, what's going on? Maybe this explains why, you know, this person behaves or acts the way that he or she does in class. If this is the world that in which he or she lives. And so we do need points of reference or at least a framework. Just like in 3D printing here, but here's this for an example. In 3D printing, you can make fantastic things. You turn liquid into a solid with light. You want to talk about fantasy. Resin 3D printing is, is, is fantasy. You can imitate the form of people. You can create mechanical parts that have, that have functional use. All out of a liquid. It's a bit of a stinky liquid, but a liquid all the same. But in order for that liquid, that vat of raw potential, all the resin in your vat can go to uh, sculpt a, um, you know, uh, uh, a cartoonish depiction of a political rival, a beautiful uh, artistic 
uh, bust. Um, uh, just a straight up, you know, this is my this is my sword and board fighter character. That could be thirty two millimeters, could be seventy five millimeters. You know, monsters that are are terrible morally or physically. Um, you can you, there's so much that you can do. It's a it's a pool of raw potential, but how do you manifest it? It needs something to latch onto. And in 3D in resin uh, printing, that's your build plate. It's that piece of metal, that immutable, rendered from this earth, piece of metal that dips down into the resin and lets the fantasy attach to it and, and brings it up in its full form. So this is why there are at least concepts of structure similarities that don't have to be you know, an allegory for something in real life or a dog whistle for this or whatever. It can be similar, but they need to work together on its own to support itself, to be that framework so that we as an outsider can go into this world and say, I don't know what's going on, but if I look over here, I look over here and I look right up here I can now gauge what's happening because I'm understanding more and that's drawing me into your world, into your story from a position of I don't know what's happening and maybe I'm just going to disengage from it I mean, how many of you out there might be guilty of that? There's just there's there's too much I'm, I'm turning off the news or, you know, I've I, I watched I watched Marvel movies through Endgame and after that I checked out because I'm not really interested in in more and more and more and more and more and more. Whatever. There has to be something that's the draw, the draw and the learning, the engagement, where we get to know more and more and more. And as we do, we're getting comfortable in the system, in this culture, in this struggle, in the conflict, even the bad stuff. We turn the next page and we go, Ugh! because of horror or something that resonates with you personally, that might be, uh, you know, a, a terrible experience, but you can't stop reading because you want to see how are they going to get through this. Also, hi, Rip Artist. What else? What else can we learn about fantasy? What is the fantasy genre? For many readers, literary fiction provides desperately needed escape. Oh, wait a minute. Someone said that not that long ago. Well, if you heard it twice, maybe it's a little bit more true than other things. For many readers, literary fiction provides desperately needed escapism so they can endure the difficulties of everyday life. Even when conjured characters inhabit a recognizable world and speak to the human condition, fictional stories can pull readers out of their own heads. This effect is even more pronounced in the fantasy genre. Untethered from scientific and societal laws and limited only by their imaginations, fantasy authors explore themes by creating their own worlds, where dragons battle in the skies, alien diplomats try to maintain peace between planets and strange creatures cohabitate the earth with humans. Fantasy is a genre of literature that features magical and supernatural elements that do not exist in the real world. Although some writers juxtapose a real world setting with fantastical elements, many create entirely imaginary universes with their own physical laws and logic and populations of imaginary races and creatures. Speculative in nature and Fantasy is speculative fiction. Fantasy is not tied to reality or scientific fact. Ooh. Perhaps our next topic to bring up. What are the subgenres and types of fantasy? Fantasy includes a robust and ever growing number of subgenres, some of which writers combine in their works. And just like if you ask Heretic Trance for, you know, 
the types of uh, how many types of goth are there? How many types of metal music are there? Fantasy is a nice catch-all. Goth is a catch-all. Even though it, it might sound specific, it can really be broken down even further from there. So you have high or epic fantasy set in a magical environment that has its own rules and physical laws. This subgenre's plots and themes have a grand scale and typically center on a single, well-developed hero or a band of heroes, such as Frodo Baggins and his cohorts in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Low fantasy. Oh, hi, Diesel. Uh, this is so true. After 30 years of not really playing d and I dropped back into DMing during COVID. Uh, get out of this world to a world where there was struggle, but in a different way. And hi from Finland. Good morning to you from Ohio. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And yes, the escapism is a big, big, big part of it. And in my professional opinion, a reason why there's been a, a detachment from a lot of modern fictional fantasies uh, because it has lost the fantastic um, but that's a that's a discussion for another time now what about a low fantasy set in the real world low fantasy includes unexpected magical elements that shock characters like the plastic figurines come to life in Lynn Reed Banks's the Indian in the cupboard I saw a very funny meme regarding this, and in the and not in 1980, but in the modern day, with people who have uh, waifu statuettes. <laughs> I'll keep it at that. Um. So it, in low fantasy, it's that the world is exactly as we know it, except this one thing, and that one thing is the pivotal. It changes everything. Magical realism. While similar to low fantasy, magical realism characters accept fantastical elements like levitation and telekinesis as a normal part of their otherwise realistic world. As in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's classic, 100 Years of Solitude. Sword and Sorcery. A subset of high fantasy, it focuses on sword-wielding heroes, such as the titular barbarian in Robert E. Howard's Conan Pulp Fiction stories as well as magic or witchcraft. Dark fantasy. Combining elements of fantasy and horror, its aim is to unnerve and frighten readers, like the gargantuan otherworldly monsters in H.P. Lovecraft's universe. Weren't we just talking about him not too long ago? Boy, it seems like such a long time ago. Fables. Using personified animals and the supernatural, Fables impart moral lessons, like the stories in Aesop's Fables and Arabian Nights. Fairy Tales Intended for children, these fairy tales and folk tales are typically set in distant magical worlds. You know, beginnings like Once Upon a Time in a Land Far, Far Away, or a Galaxy Far, Far Away. Well, as much as, as that as fantasy and as a form of escapism has recently not been. And I, I, I say that not with no glee in my heart. Where trolls, dragons, witches, and other supernatural characters are an accepted truth, as in the Brothers Grimm, uh, the Brothers Grimm's Grimm's fairy tales. And superhero fiction. Unlike stories, in which a hero acquires special abilities through specific means, such as exposure to radiation, these protagonist powers are supernatural. I'm sorry, not specific, scientific means. And maybe that's something that doesn't quite often come up. Superhero stories are fantasy. Yeah, I guess they are fantasy, but I don't know. Did, did you all ever actively think of superhero stories as fantasy? Maybe they are their own thing. Fantastical elements have always been a part of storytelling, as evidenced by the gods, monstrous beasts, and magic found in ancient mythologies, folklore, and religious texts around the globe. 
fantasy as a literary genre is much more recent and differs from its predecessors because its authors are known and both they and their audiences understand the works to be fictitious. <clears throat> Modern fantasy began in the 19th century following a period of chivalrous European romances and tales whose fantastical elements were still considered somewhat believable. Scottish author George MacDonald, whose novel uh, Fantastus features a young man drawn into a dream world where he has a series of adventures, is credited with writing the first plainly fictitious fantasy for adults. Englishman William Morris, who's known for medieval fantasy and specifically his novel The Well at the World's End, subsequently broke ground in the genre by completely inventing a fantasy world that existed beyond the known world. Yes, Jacer, exactly. So, building upon the legacies of MacDonald and Morris, Tolkien penned the first high fantasy, The Lord of the Rings. Both creatively and commercially successful, the epic ushered the genre into the mainstream and influenced countless writers, making Tolkien the undisputed father of modern fantasy. If not for Tolkien and successful contemporaries such as C.S. Lewis, author of the Chronicles of Narnia series, and Ursula K. Le Guin, author of the Earth Sea series, the genre might still exist in the literary periphery. This, talking about the Sword of Shannara, uh, Harry Potter, the type of fantasy that many of us know is not that old. In the grand scheme of writing, in the grand scheme of writing, it is not even a hundred years old. What are some common elements and characteristics of the genre? Various conflicts. And that was brought up before too. Good versus evil. Um, the quest for power and knowledge. Man versus nature himself. Coming of age. Love, betrayal, etc. You can read about that. Again, I'm not going to read the entire site to all, but the, the important parts that I wanted that I want to get out to you all. Here's another good question. What is the difference between fantasy, science fiction, and horror? And we discussed horror in the uh, in the uh, Call of Cthulhu writing workshop that we did last week. Fantasy. The genre typically has no basis in scientific fact or speculation. It includes implausible supernatural and magical elements such as the wizards of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series, or the dragons, gigantes, and white walkers of George R.R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. Science fiction. By contrast, science fiction features technology and natural or technological scenarios that are currently possible or may realistically become possible in the future. For example, in his short story Burning Chrome, and novel Neuromancer, sci-fi author William Gibson coined the phrase cyberspace and wrote about a complex network of computer databases sharing information predicting the internet. And uh, where this might come into being as well, because it, it says about our natural scenarios that are currently possible or may be realistically possible. Um, Uh, what was the movie about everything getting cold really quick? Uh, the Day After Tomorrow, I think it was. The Day After Tomorrow. And, and similar disaster movies of that era. Era Like, there was one about volcanoes. and It was sort of a, its own, like, Hollywood. Like, everyone, every studio needed a, uh, you know, some sort of, like, um, environmental disaster movie. That, by this definition, would be more science fiction. Not be, you know, like, uh, or, uh, Twister. Yeah, it was Twister. When they made the little, like, air measuring things, you know, that, that, that's science fiction. It was also not necessarily implausible. But it was about phenomena that, thankfully, you know, are not happening, but could well happen now or in the future. 
Now, what about horror? Let's dip back into that well for a moment. Unlike the other two genres, which may contain horrific elements, horror is primarily focused on mood. Its fundamental aim is to create an unsettling, uh-oh, there's the A word, atmosphere. Atmosphere, atmosphere, atmosphere. And provide the reader with a sense of fear and dread. The setting and circumstances of horror may be entirely realistic, as in Stephen King's Cujo, where a family's bat-bitten St. Bernard becomes rabid and terrorizes them. However, horror can include elements of both fantasy and science fiction. Take H.P. Lovecraft's fantastical extraterrestrial deities, the Great Old Ones, or the bloodthirsty Great White Shark in Peter Benchley's Jaws, for example. But the ultimate goal is to unnerve readers, not... I mean, yeah, and entertaining through that is not necessarily the uh, the escapism first and foremost that a fantasy might offer. And here are some recommendations uh, for examples of fantasy literature. And as I said, the the D and D books also have a list of recommended reading. And maybe you all out there have uh, a recommended novel maybe even a graphic novel uh something from a, a small you know a startup writer an audio book or just something that's you know kind of uncommon like i don't see uh i don't see the dragon riders of pern why aren't the dragon riders of pern uh up on this list surely you all would agree that the dragon riders of pern should be on a fantasy reading list Hi, Nick. We are we're getting uh, primed for the writing right now by exploring what makes fantasy fantasy. Now I have one oh, one more thing. One more thing. It's hard to write a guide to a whole genre, especially one as vast and as intricate as fantasy. But as a zealot of all things fantastical, it's something I want to tackle. Let's jump straight in it by looking at the main aspects of the average fantasy book. By definition, fantasy is a genre that typically features the use of magic or other supernatural phenomena in the plot, setting, or theme. Magical or mythological creatures often feature, as well as races other than humans, such as elves, dwarves, or goblins. The worlds within fantasy books are usually medieval in style, both in terms of technology and culture. This is what primarily sets fantasy apart from sci-fi. Now here, I, I mean, I could disagree. Uh, I would say Battletech. Battletech is very clearly science fiction, but very clearly medieval. <laughs> Just because they have giant pew-pew robots and Stompy Boys um, does not itself make it pure fantasy or not sci-fi. Now, that in a nutshell might be a, a you know something that's passable. But what about what about some other other considerations here? Ah, Rose Wolf of the Book Devouring Horde has a suggestion. Uh, Rain Benari's novels are a good fantasy series. And Nick says, what about Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champions? I have not, uh, I, I have not read uh, books from either author. So I, I'm sorry if I have disappointed either of you. Not that, that that in no way indicates whether they're good or, good or bad uh, fiction or especially fantasy. I just have no personal experience with them. So we've heard this before, epic, uh, epic fantasy, high fantasy, ah, dark fantasy, which mixes in horror or grim themes, grim dark, employing a dystopian element. You know, many people would describe uh, Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 as grim dark, the opposite of which is noble bright, steampunk, arcane punk, or sometimes people might call it hex punk. And then you have diesel punk as well. There's historical fantasy. Incorporating magic into historical fiction 
often mixed with the sword and sorcery subgenre. Uh, or uh, if any of you have read Outlander, Outlander uh, would be a historical fantasy. And lastly, urban fantasy, which blends the ideas of magic and myth in the modern day worlds. Urban fantasy here, this would be Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, this would be uh, Call of Cthulhu, if we're talking game systems. Rosewolf has a suggestion as well. Kate Daniels series by Yona Andrews is a wonderful, or Elona Andrews is a wonderful urban fantasy series. Nick says, it's okay, I only know of Mr. Moorcock's books. It's a high fantasy series. Hoylepa says, uh, other... Other question is what theme or focus is your story on? And that's what we're going to talk about in the next segment, Hoylepa. I want to know which kind of fantasy you all want to pursue, but I want to make sure that we are having the conversation first about what is out there so that we can make that decision as a, as a group here tonight. Build yourself a world. This is, this is very much repeated in all of the resources. The world building is a big and essential part. The world is a character itself. And the world is a stage, as, I don't know, some random no-name person once said. And that is going to be where your fantasy takes place. Magic is almost a prerequisite of the genre. Now, it it, it is conceded here, even though there are fantasy books that don't feature magic in an obvious way, they still deal with otherworldly occurrences or the supernatural. So magic in that case is not, you know, Alakazam, Presto Changeo, Levios Hall. It it is the non our Earth manifestations of things, and the magic system is essential for the fantasy story, and that's why we're dedicating. A workshop segment to just that building a mythology maybe never getting into it but always have something in the periphery you want hey hey your attention look at this look at this look at this but also you know like look at me this is kind of why I chose this as the background you see my face you see the the faces I'm making as I speak with expression I am gesticulating on camera for you and you don't even have to be a tier 3 sub to watch me gesticulate on camera. I'm gesticulating on camera in front of you all. But there's more to what I'm saying than just me. Did I just grow wings out, out the side of my head? What's going on here? There's something behind me, something around me. You can kind of make sense of what it is from the little bit that you get. But it's not the main feature. I am the main feature. That mythology does so much to help uh, make your world more fleshed out and reined in without needing to go down just a hard-coded, um, you know, a hard-coded list of things. I, man, I have a, I have a tenuous relationship with The Witcher. A lot of it I liked. And there were parts of it that just, I, I felt disappointed. <laughs> I felt disappointed as the reader. Uh, I am not yucking anyone's yum, and I, you know, Maybe you all could guess the parts that I, I fell out of favor with. Um, but there was so much, and I really enjoyed it, up until certain parts happened. And then I, I said, <sighs> well, not, uh, not tonight. We're taking a step-by-step, chunk-by-chunk approach to setting the stage uh, to writing a book, Nick. So, there's that. We've gone over... Um, we've, uh, we've gone over 
what is fantasy? Generally, what what can constitute it? Do we have enough? Do we have enough to set up a boundary? You see the black border here? Now, there's a lot going on inside. But it is contained. And so, ultimately, we only have to focus on this right here. That's the setup. Because I want us to refresh ourselves for fantasy and to be familiar with it, and we can make those calls going forward. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to get up and take a quick little break. I'm going to walk around a little bit. Eh, I'm almost at a refill point for my... Well, I won't get a cranberry ginger again, but man, these are tasty. Um, I will refresh myself, and when I return, I want to explore the subgenres, and with your all's help, I want you to help me select the subgenre of fantasy that we're going to be writing towards. Okay? So keep this stuff in mind, and we will review it. And I'll be back soon, and I need your all's help for this next part. So don't go anywhere. And invite a friend, too.